Okay, all right. So I think everybody's filtering in from the last uh, from the last panel. Uh, we were in pretty much the home stretch of the uh, of the of this summit. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful conversation now with um, Kate uh, Eberly Walker and uh, Lorraine Marchand uh, on telehealth or telecare innovation. I should say. Um, we're going to bring them onto the stage now. Uh, please, again, feel free to um, use the um, chat function to uh, to interact with all of the other attendees, um, as well as post your LinkedIn's um, and uh, and websites uh, to get connected. Um, and also, please feel free to use the Q and A function uh, to pose any questions you have for our wonderful guests today. Uh, and here come Kate and Lorraine. Um, I'm going to um, uh, cede the floor to you, Lorraine. Uh, you're going to be uh, leading the conversation here. So I will pass over to you and uh, thank you for uh, coming on and sharing your insights. Yeah, well, thank you, Jerry. And thank you for everyone who is uh, with us through this wonderful session started early this morning and uh, some fabulous topics and, and panelists that we've heard from today. So Kate and I are quite honored to be here. So my name's Lorraine Marchand and I'm the general manager of life sciences for IBM Watson Health. And I'm also the author of a book that Columbia University Press is publishing this September. It's called The Innovation Mindset. And in just a moment, I'll introduce our special guest, Kate Eberly Walker, who's the CEO of Presence Learning. So telecare is defined as any service bringing health and social care directly to a user's home, supported by information and communication technology. And as we've talked about throughout the day and particularly this afternoon, telecare, which was spurred by the pandemic, has grown to a greater than $90 billion industry with a 32% annual growth rate. Some say its potential is greater than even that and that it has the possibility of fundamentally altering the way medicine is practiced and the way we care for ourselves. It's an intriguing topic. But not all forms of telecare are equal, and despite its recent growth surge, it's an area that's ripe for innovation and disruption, the kind of fresh thinking and creativity that I explore in my book, The Innovation Mindset. In our HIT Lab presentation today, we will examine the innovations bubbling up in telecare and introduce one pioneering woman who's leading the change through her teletherapy company, presence learning. If we do just a quick run through of some of the highlights in this industry, though, we're aware that EHR based telecare, which allows providers to access data on patients anytime, any place, and then by mixing it with apps directly collecting information from patients can not only improve care, but it can impact workflow and overall patient management. Innovations like telemedicine and the internet of wearable technology and devices, whether it's smart inhalers, spirometers, EKG monitoring, allows the collection of data directly from the patients and has become a staple of telecare. And of course, we can't talk about telecare without a discussion about augmented reality. And if we look at it from the provider's perspective, smart glasses, dentist tools, vein scanners are assisting providers learning and training in, in terms of uh, performing complex procedures. But what we wanna turn our attention to for the rest of this session is a look at the patient facing benefits of telecare, better ways to administer behavioral therapy and speech and language therapy. Can we imagine that telecare could actually replace the need for these type of providers? Well, we're going to take a little pivot here and talk to Kate and get her perspective on this. First, let me introduce Kate. Kate Eberly Walker has more than 20 years of experience leading, advising, acquiring, and investing in education companies. Prior to leading Presence Learning, Kate was CEO of the Princeton Review and managed strategy and investments for its owner, Kaplan. She served on several education-focused boards, including the famous Rosetta Stone, 
Babel and Prospect Schools, a charter school management organization that educates racially and economically diverse students. Kate began her career, interestingly, as an investment banker at Goldman Sachs, and she holds an MBA from the Harvard Business School. Her company, Presence Learning, is a leading provider of teletherapy and software solutions for special education-related services and behavioral mental health counseling. Their mission is to empower anyone who serves children with diverse needs, and they describe themselves as leading the way in teletherapy in this area. This innovative perspective that they bring is exactly what I talk about in my book, and Kate is going to help would-be telecare entrepreneurs with her lessons today, as well as those of you who are seasoned. Kate, thank you so much for speaking with us today about Presence, the teletherapy company that you lead that, that brings these behavioral and language and therapy uh, to, to children in need. Um, you do it by offering a remote-based therapy model that allows therapists, which as we discussed are mostly working moms, to work from home. Now, in my book called The Innovation Mindset, I talk about how the most critical success factor com for commercializing a new idea is the ability to solve a meaningful problem, one that impacts a lot of people and that one is someone ultimately is willing to pay for. So it seems to me, present solves two problems. The first one is improving access to quality care for children. And the second one is enabling stay-at-home moms to work remotely and have a vibrant and well-paying career. But it would be helpful to hear directly from you what inspired the vision and your mission for Presence. Thank you, Lorraine. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. So, so yeah, so let's, let's talk about the initial inspiration, the need that we were seeing and addressing. So it, it, we started out very, very specifically looking at gaps in delivery of therapy to children with special education needs in public schools. And this, this goes back to the company's founding in 2009. And uh, the problem that existed then still, still persists today where you have a growing number of children diagnosed with learning disabilities. Their schools are required to provide them with expert therapy services in school. And there are really rampant job vacancies for those roles in schools. So we looked at that and at the beginning, what we thought we were solving was actually a pure geography problem. We said, well, there are more of these speech pathologists living in places like Connecticut and New York and California, and there's a, a higher need for these therapists in more remote or rural districts. So we'll build a teletherapy platform, will hire these therapists and we'll solve, we'll solve that disconnect and we'll make them available to these children who they can't be there, be with in person, but who they can connect with. So at the beginning, we weren't even really looking to do the service better or to optimize the experience of the therapy. It started with just purely these kids need experts and they can't, they can't get them in the room in the schools. Uh, it evolved, as you said, over over time. To, we we kept, you know, finding and expanding uh, what what other problems we thought we could address. Yeah, it, really interesting start, and and also how you kind of followed the problem and the feedback that you were getting, and pivoted until you landed on the solution that was important to the marketplace and the customers that you serve. Kate, maybe just tell the audience how large is Presence and how many children in schools do you do you serve, and also how many therapists do you employ? Just give a give us a sense of the size. Sure. So we have about two hundred and fifty corporate employees and a network of over 2000 therapists who work for us. And we work with about 800 school districts across the country now. And um, we, have, we have about 60,000 children receiving therapy services and then about, about 100,000 more who have received some type of evaluation or assessment or diagnosis or have interacted with our clinicians in some other way. That's really, really impressive. And you've grown this over the last 10 years and obviously have 
are addressing a need. Can you tell us a little bit about the customer research that you conducted? I know that you needed to speak with schools, you needed to speak with teachers, with parents, and also with the therapists that you've recruited to provide the services. So kind of walk us through how you approached your customer research, what you learned, and how you've applied it. Yeah, so I mean, as always, right, you you what you figure out what what service you really need to provide when when you go and you talk to the the customers in this who in this case were administrators in schools who were responsible for doing the hiring and delivering the services. And we we learned most of our incremental businesses that we've launched uh, since the the initial speech teletherapy came from our customers telling us, you know, here's what we really need. Is there any way you could do this? Probably the biggest example of that was when we started, uh, we started doing research and ultimately rolling out digital remote assessment for uh, cognitive and behavioral disabilities. So that came directly from talking to customers who said, you know, it's great, it's great that you do speech therapy, but our real challenge is getting a school psychologist to come. It started with a very remote district that worked with us in Oregon who said, you know, we just can't hire, we can't get any, which we've tried flying people in to, to do the evaluations. It's a constant problem. Is there any way you could solve it? And that led to, um, you know, partnering with assessment makers, uh, partnering with a researcher out of NYU to validate the, the remote administration and, and, you know, prove that it could be done in an alternative format. And, and you know, it was really, it was really very, very innovative what we did it was very controversial at the time the idea of you know could you do it this way um but i think i, I think we were more uh, you know, more ambitious and, and motivated to really try to figure it out because we were hearing pretty clearly from, from the customer side that this was something that they desperately needed. Yeah, really interesting comment. And uh, I can remember when uh, cognitive remote uh, information gathering sort of came to the world of clinical trials, right? Because it was so convenient to be able to gather information instead of maybe having a patient come into the office. But you're right, in those early days, being able to measure the results of it and make sure that it was equivalent to the experience of actually sitting in front of that provider. That's what I think everybody was concerned about. And, you know, when we talk about measuring success, if we can move on to that for, for a few minutes, how do you think about that? How is success measured in the, the teletherapy area from your perspective and what metrics does presence think are the most meaningful? That's that's for sure evolved over time because at the beginning it was real success was making uh, making a therapy session happen to, you know getting giving access to the service and so you know we were tracking with our school partners you know what percent of kids in special education programs were not getting served um, before before launching teletherapy and, and then after and it was really this very pure you know is it happening or is it not happening um, I think what has really expanded, particularly with COVID, of course, we can't we can't talk about about telecare without talking about the you know the massive um, shift and impact of the COVID experience. For us, it just meant that there was such a broader experience, such a broader research base to really start looking at um, driving more more meaningful long long term outcomes. Uh, where we could start measuring the the efficacy. Is it better? Where is it better um, in delivering an outcome for a child? And so that we that you know is earlier days, but we we look to measure how many uh, you know how many minutes a week are needed. You know how quickly can you graduate a student uh, from you know more intensive therapy to less intensive therapy? Um, you know and ultimately you know how many how many sessions does it take to start to see the impact? Mm -hmm. And maybe before we uh, we start to close out on my last question, I'm going to sneak this one in because we I really haven't. Uh, asked you then about the therapists themselves, mm -hmm. uh, maybe just a, a little bit about the profile, because certainly you're doing so much in order to encourage and support working women, particularly working moms in this field. And uh, maybe you can just, you know, comment on that, as well mm -hmm. as how you train them to have consistency across such a broad workforce that you that you employ. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, the, 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 this workforce is why I came to Presence Learning. So I, I joined the company 10 years after its founding in 2019. And I, I was already very passionate uh, about advocating for women in the workplace. I've, I've written a book about this. Um, and as I got to know what we were doing, I realized that the, the solution is actually about solving for women and creating job opportunities that will retain them and keep them in the field. You know, back to that original problem, there's all these job vacancies, schools can't hire enough speech pathologists. When I looked at that and realized that 97% of speech pathologists are women, uh, the majority of them, about, about 80% of our clinical network are working mothers of school-aged children. Uh, you know, that what was happening when I started talking to them and hearing stories was, was I realized they had been working in school until maybe they had their first child or maybe they, their second. And then they decided that that you know, didn't fit their lifestyle to have those jobs that involved really long hours and a lot of driving from site to site. So creating a remote way for them to work turned out to be really attractive. And, and it's allowed us to, to grow from those early days of you know, trying this out with 20 therapists to, to now, as I said, having over 2,000 who who are choosing to work this way. Um, the training is actually, uh, it's, it's not as difficult in this field because you, you've highly educated um, and uh, you know, therapists with master's degree level, many of them PhD level expertise. So they know how to work with children. They know how to do the clinical work. They simply need the training on how to, how to do it online, how to use the platform. And, and we actually took um, in the early months of COVID when you all of a sudden had all of these therapists working in schools who were forced to very quickly figure out how can I do this online? Uh, how can I kind of move my practice in that way? We, we actually formalized the, the training that we had always done for our own clinical onboarding into something we called Teletherapy 101 and that we rolled out across schools all over the country um, to really break it down. And, and that, was, that was another inflection point for, for the company and has turned into a, a long-term offering that we have that we didn't have before. And, and it again came out of that realization of, you know, what do your customers need from you? What I was hearing loud and clear was, you, you, you guys have already spent 10 years figuring out how to do this work online. We need you to teach a, you know, a whole lot more people how to, how to do that. So um, that that's also been really helpful in kind of centering for us, helping us recognize that what we're really doing so much of it is about the workforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a real, uh, very strong contribution. Well, Kate, maybe in closing, I know we're out of time here, unfortunately, because it'd be great to, to learn a little bit more. But as a, a woman entrepreneur, you've accomplished so much and really were so impressed with the innovation of presence learning. What would your advice be to someone starting out who wanted to, uh, to innovate in general or particularly in the telecare area? I would say, you know, really, really, you've got to believe in what you're doing and believe that it can be better and channel that passion into every conversation you're having. These, so many of my conversations have been these uphill climbs to persuade people that this, this is a, you know, a good way, an equal way, a better way um, to get people to try what is, you know, a less comfortable modality. And so it takes, a, it takes a lot of inner belief, right? And, and I think when you choose to work Work, work in an area or build something that that you've got that that real passion and belief that you know this this will be better um this will do something better for the world uh i think i think you know that's where you end up driving growth and finding that people really do need what you have yeah no the passion the curiosity the you know the welcoming of change and certainly the resilience and i think that you embody all of that well, thank you. I guess we should invite uh, Jerry into the room. I don't know whether we have any questions from any of the participants or uh, there's Jerry. Hey guys. Uh, yeah, no, wonderful conversation guys. I don't think I saw anything in the chat. Um, uh, someone did say something um, about data security and compliance. I think uh, it was, uh, I'm not sure if it was more of a passing comment than an actual question mark, but um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, unfortunately we're out of time and it would be great to to maybe hear a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, from from you guys. But thank you for coming on and sharing your insights, both Lorraine and Kate. Um, and um, yeah, it's it it wonderful to have you on. Uh, and I uh, hope to see you on another panel uh, in the future. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Kate.
Thank you, Lorraine, and thanks everyone for listening. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.